Hello and welcome to Novosibirsk, the self-proclaimed capital of Siberia, a scientific, cultural, business and transport center of one of the harshest regions of our planet and also a home to a million and a half inhabitants. It's quite rare to find a city in such a cold and desolate area, but talented and persistent people of this remote land are successfully managing to make it work in every aspect a well-functioning city must have. This is a premiere episode of what I hope to become a YouTube series dedicated to public transport systems of the world. And today I want to start by showing you how people do get around in my snow-covered hometown, Novosibirsk, Russia. Let's begin our exploration with the metro system. It was built in the dusk of the Soviet Union in the mid-80s of the last century as a single project and is the third busiest system in Russia, after Moscow and St. Petersburg. Most of the station entrances are standalone pavilions made of metal and glass and decorated with marble panels. They feature heavy swing doors that are meant to protect the station vestibule from the cold air coming in from the street. All the vestibules are located a few flights of stairs under the ground, and none of them have neither escalators to the street level nor lifts. Inside the station you will be greeted by bored security guards, who are instructed to molest people with large bags and backpacks. Metro also employs a special turnstile watching lady, and of course you will find a couple ticket windows and a few ticket machines. You pay for each single trip, which costs around 40 cents. You can use your contactless bank card directly on turnstile, or just do it the old-fashioned way and buy a token coin. The turnstile will hit you hard if you try to pass for free. I was always afraid of this when I was little. Unlike Moscow, Novosibirsk is located in a remote area that is unreachable by potential enemy's missiles. For that reason, its metro was never intended to be a nuclear bomb shelter, so it's relatively shallow and stations are only 10 meters or 30 feet deep. Stations are modestly decorated with marble and granite. Most of them are triple span shallow column stations with wide island platforms, like this Oktyabrskaya station, named after the October Revolution that led to the establishment of the Soviet government. Another notable station is Sibirska, which features Florentine mosaics, showing different sides of Siberian nature. As there are only two metro lines, it is the only interchange station allowing transfer to Krasny Prospect, which means Red Avenue, the main street of the city. Marshal Pokryshkina station displays expressive text embellishments on its walls and is dedicated to the local war hero that was extremely good at taking down Hitler's aircraft during World War II. There also are some interesting single water stations like Zaylsovska, the northern terminal, and Karl Marx Square, the southern terminal and the most busy station on the network. And how about a space sim station that is dedicated to Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space? Personally, I'm not a big fan of these classical stone decorated Soviet palaces, so with a touch of high tech, Gagarin Sky Station has always been my favorite. River Terminal Station is located at the foundation of the bridge across the river Obi and is the only station that has side platforms. It also is the only station that is not located completely under the ground. Its vestibule has a lot of air and sunlight, and station walls are decorated with stained glass, showing different Siberian towns. As the station architect explained, these are meant to be the illuminators of a giant ship sailing across the Siberian land, transformed by the labor of Soviet people. The metro bridge itself is considered one of the Novosibirsk sites, because, as many local residents believe, it is the longest metro bridge in the world, which of course is not true given how much completely elevated metro lines are out there, but this is still a pretty impressive structure, which is more than 2 kilometers long and in reality is the longest covered metro bridge in the world. The reasons for building it this way are extreme climatic conditions, probably also the world's harshest to operate metro system. Winter temperatures can be as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius, and covered galleries protect railway tracks and third rail from snow and ice and prevent at least some of the freezing cold wind from getting inside the wind holes of the train cars. We can definitely say that riding the metro bridge is the best part of the trip in our metro. It also is an emblematic part of the city embankment. No wonder it's such a popular photo spot. But let's get back under the ground. There are 13 stations in total that form two lines, 
Zakawa about a third of the city's demand for rapid transit, but only two new stations were built during the past 20 years. Besides having their names and subsequent stations list being written on the walls, stations also have navigation signs at each end of the station. What's interesting is that metro tracks are numbered 1 and 2, an audio announcer refers to these numbers when announcing arriving trains. That's right, to be even more formal, she also emphasized that the upcoming train is an electric multiple unit. Both lines are served by the same depot and have the same rolling stock that consists of these most common late Soviet metro trains. They were developed at the beginning of the 70s and are pretty brutal to modern standards. There is no air condition, but fresh air gets into cars through vents, which also means a very weak soundproofing. There also are a few trains that have a restyled looks, but inside they are essentially the same. As you have probably noticed, voice announcements are performed with great solemnity and dignity. When I used to come for a visit from Moscow, I always felt like I got into slow motion. Just listen to this. Train speed is very decent though. Full end to end ride of 10 km or 6.5 mile long line 1 takes just 15 minutes with 6 intermediate stops located about 1 or 1.5 km from each other. Trains start circulating at 5.45 am and finish at midnight. The rush hour interval is 3 minutes and you can easily calculate how much you will have to wait for a train by looking at this retro style 7 segment displays showing just how long ago the previous train has departed. Stations are built to fit 5 coach trains, but currently 4 coach trains are used. Platforms have marks for train doors, and train doors are stopped exactly there, which is very convenient. Train delays are uncommon, and schedule accuracy is astonishing 99.97%. Stations and rolling stock are very well maintained. I've never seen a single graffiti or a broken window. People here love the small metro, and treat it with respect. On average, it moves 220,000 people a day, and the cost price of a single trip is 20% lower than the fare, making the Novosibirsk Metro a profitable organization. But we've spent enough time under the ground. Let's go out to the street and see what do we have there. The most amusing on-street transport is of course the tram, and Siberian capital has lots of this. The most common streetcars are the Series 62103, which were initially produced in Belarus but are now assembled right here in Novosibirsk, using refurbished frames and wheel trucks from old trams, decommissioned by local depots, and brand new bodies and electrical equipment from Belarus. They might look dated, with only middle section of a car being low floor and overall antique design, but Novosibirsk is not a rich city, and that's the best you can get for $280,000 per year. Another ultra-cheap way of upgrading the rolling stock is buying decommissioned trams from Moscow. They are about 15 to 20 years old, and being direct ancestors of Soviet-produced trams are even more dated, but are still in relatively good shape, comparing to what was serving the city before them. The side story behind those 
is that municipalities of the European part of Russia are getting these trams for free in exchange for political points for Moscow mayor, which apparently plans to be promoted to a high position in federal government, while Novosibirsk, not representing any electoral interest, has to pay for them. And as an exotic you can also find a few Tatra KD4 trams that were previously serving the streets of Berlin. These are the only multi-section cars in the city, and even being more than 30 years old, are still probably the most modern and convenient. But unfortunately, the Novosibirsk City Hall, being one of the owners of that local outdated tram producing factory, has banned buying rolling stock from Europe, cutting the Novosibirsk from the decent quality street car supply. And then we finally get to the kings of snowy streets of Novosibirsk, the iconic red street cars, who have walked more than 35 years without a single overhaul. One can immediately notice that they are still using bow collectors, as that tells us an interesting fact that overhead lines were fitted for use with pantographs only in the early 2000s when the city first started buying new cars. My dad used to walk in this as a tram driver, I used to ride this to school, and they are still the first image that comes to mind when you think of a tram. Look how warm and welcoming they are on a cold and dark Siberian morning. It's a perfect start for the day. Let's take a ride in one of these. There aren't many ones left in service and I was only able to catch the amplified one. You see, in provincial Russia it's still common for a bus or a tram crew to consist of two people, a driver and a conductor, whose job is to collect fares cruising back and forth the tram interior with a small coin purse. Nowadays you can also pay your fare with a regular contactless bank card, watch these you fancy European cities. But back to Siberia. Deciding to save money on conductor's salaries, but not being aware of any other way to prevent ticketless rides, they decided to install turnstiles inside the tram cars, not only for entrance, but also for exit. Have you ever seen anything more ridiculous than that? The conductor's throne is still there, by the way, a specially designated high seat, from which you could observe entering passengers and loudly announce stops. The most cozy thing about these trams is that each seat is heated individually, after half an hour waiting for the tram, it feels great to finally sit in a hot wooden chair and watch the cold blizzard outside. Beware, there is a couple of unlucky seats that have a sandbox instead of a heater underneath them. It's hot with all these heaters on, so even in the winter one or two windows might be open. That switch is for emergency door opener by the way, and the door chain drive mechanism is usually exposed to the public, so you can easily see how it works. Lightning fixtures in these trams are also very stylish, and four ventilation braids over the driver's door are the signature features of its interior. In the same Novosibirsk streetcar factory, they have also performed an overhaul on a few of these units. Apart from technical maintenance, they gave it a more modern look, and unfortunately got rid of famous chain drive sliding doors and changed all warm wooden seats to cold plastic ones. Good job, people! Maybe now it's time to fix the rails. And last but not least is the St. Petersburg produced car, which was the first they have bought to replace these old red ones. I was in fifth grade back then and it was scheduled to run at exactly the same time I was on my way to school. And riding it was making me the happiest child in the world. Now that we've seen all the rolling stock, let's take a look at the net. It was almost a hundred of kilometers of double track once. But after the metro system was built, the rails were removed from the central part of the city and the bridge in order to make more room for cars. This divided the whole network into two unconnected networks, on left and right banks of the river Ot, and made Rams a second-class transport. Being expelled from the city center, it now serves the so-called micro-districts, Soviet housing estates that consist of nine-story large concrete panel system residential buildings, 
mixed with schools, outpatient hospitals and recreation areas. You are now looking at southwestern housing estate. It is located at the southwestern edge of the city, and the tram is a splendid complement to this beautifully planned neighborhood. Two lines meet here, allowing fast and traffic-free access to Kalmak Square metro station, as well as western side commuter train station. Even those local residents who prefer using cars are benefiting from having a tram connection by building private garages inside the tram reversal ring. I won't lie if I say that people of southwestern housing estate love the tram. It truly transforms what could have been a remote and depressive neighborhood into a bright and colorful place to live. Trams also serve bleak and desolate industrial areas. That's what it originally was built for here, to transport Soviet workers from their residences to their giant plants, producing turbo generators or electric arc furnaces. Street cars here are passing through giant roundabouts, another signature trait of newly built Soviet cities. This area is not lifeless though, and the city continues expansion behind its industrial areas, giving these tram lines a second life. And if you prefer to live in the luxury of your own house, but also have access to the city's rapid transit system, that's also possible in Novosibirsk. Streetcar can be given right to the door of your private residence. It won't take you to the city center, because we are currently on the left bank and the bridge has been cut off, so you'll have to use the metro, and here we are, back in the downtown. They've kept one line in the city center. It passes through quiet and calm streets parallel to noisy Red Avenue, the main axis of the city. Trams are painted differently on the right bank, as the proportion of brand new rolling stock is higher. They get very close to the heart of the city, the world famous opera and ballet theater, and have a reversal ring around the park behind it, which is not the final stop of any route, and is only used to reverse trams in case of an accident. The most legendary tram route is number 13, which passes through the busy intersections and shares the road with cars, giving it a fame of messless judge for negligent car drivers, which is often associated with its unlucky number. Sometimes its revenge even precedes traffic rules violations, like in this accident involving a tram number 13 with a failed braking system. It's actually not funny anymore, people got injured, and the poor state of both rolling stock and tracks is a serious issue. The system works with outdated technologies of the middle of the last century and primitive manual labor. You can often see drivers having to leave their tram cars to turn the track switch manually with a poker. I talk about the tram like it's some convenient rapid transit system, but very few people here see it this way, and it's hard to judge them. Both pedestrians and car drivers often perceive the tram like some slow rumbling tin can and pay absolutely no respect to multi-ton steel cars, provoking sharp braking and other dangerous situations. Giving trams priority at intersections could significantly improve their speed and make them more attractive to passengers. Yes, it might be noisy and swaying, but so is the metro. A little bit of market regulation won't hurt, because now the trams have to compete with private minibus companies that take away all their paying passengers. But even the government doesn't see or doesn't want to see the potential of fast and eco-friendly transport. It's all changing in the last few years though. They even have constructed a 2km extension of the existing line to the newly built neighborhood. And people seem to be liking it. Let's hope that this trend will continue and we'll see more new lines being built. Now we have found out that the construction costs just $560,000 per kilometer, which is way cheaper than metro. And that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to subscribe. Next time we'll talk about commuter trains and electric buses. Now a little favor. Please try to remember which drum did you like the most and post its time code to the comments. I'm very curious about how does all of this feel to you guys, so please don't hesitate. Bye!